Hi, and welcome to this lecture on density and pressure. We're going to cover some basics of density, some basics of pressure, things you've probably seen before, but I'll add a few new items that you may have not uh, seen in previous classes. Let's go ahead and get started. If you look at your screen, you'll see a nice picture of a, a beautiful cup of coffee with various layers in it. Uh, these layers are stratified based on their density, um, with the least dense being up on top and the most dense at the bottom. So it's related to, to uh, today's uh, lecture of, uh, regarding density. So let's go ahead and get into it. First of all, we'll start with density. And you're all probably familiar with the uh, concept of density from your earlier classes. In this class, we're going to use the symbol rho, and it'll have the dimensions of mass per unit volume or mass per length cubed. And common units that we use for density include kilograms per cubic meter, uh, pounds mass per cubic foot, or slugs per cubic foot. You've probably seen density or something related to it in a thermal course. There we often deal with specific volume. Specific volume and density are just inverses of one another. So let me write that down as well. So the density is one over the specific volume. In thermodynamics, we typically use specific volume whereas in fluid mechanics, we typically use density. All right, uh, so you're probably already familiar with those concepts. Let's now talk about something that might be a little new to you. So first of all, specific weight. So specific weight, we'll give it the symbol gamma, and it's just rho times g. It's the weight per unit volume. So the dimensions of specific weight would be force per unit volume. A weight is a force. So force per length cubed, for example, and typical units would be newtons per cubic meter or pounds force per cubic foot. The um, specific weight shows up pretty frequently. That, that combination of density times gravity is a pretty common uh, grouping of terms, so we'll, we'll refer to it pretty frequently in this course. So it's weight per unit volume. You can see in the equation if I just multiplied rho times v, I would get the mass, and then multiply it by g, then you get weight. Okay, so this is weight per unit volume. Specific gravity is another one that might be new to you. Specific gravity, we'll give it the symbol Sg, is the density of a fluid divided by the density of water at 4 degrees Celsius. So it's a ratio. This one has no units to it at all, no dimensions. It's just a ratio telling you how dense your fluid is relative to water. And why water at 4 degrees C? It's because um, that has a, uh, a nice round number to it. So water at 4 degrees C is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So it's an easy number to remember, and it's, it's useful to remember. So whenever we talk about the density of water, we typically use a value of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. So if we had a specific gravity, let's say for mercury, another common fluid we deal with, of 13.6, it means it's 13.6 times as dense as water, or the density of mercury is 13,600 kilograms per cubic meter. Okay. Now, while we're at it, let's talk a little bit about some other common densities that um, we'll use. One, one in particular is the density of air at standard temperature and pressure. That's 1.23 kilograms per cubic meter that's another one that's worth remembering because we'll use the density of air frequently. The standard temperature and pressure, uh, the temperature at standard temperature and pressure is 15 degrees C, and the pressure at standard temperature and pressure is 101.325 kilopascals absolute. And I'll talk in a moment what I mean by absolute there. So those are just some common numbers to keep in mind um, because we use them frequently. Uh, one other one just related to the specific weight of uh, water, since that's one that we, uh, a fluid that we use frequently, would be 9,810 newtons per cubic meter, so it's just 1,000 times 9.81, or in English units, 62.4 pounds force per cubic foot. So every cubic foot of water weighs about 62 pounds. All right, let's go ahead and move on to pressure. Again, this is another quantity that you've, oh, uh, actually before we do that, one other thing about density. One last, uh, two last items. Number one, um, 
as a rule of thumb, the density of liquids is about a thousand times greater than the density of gases. So let me just write this over here as a rule of thumb. The density of liquids is about a thousand times larger than the density of gases. So you can see that here the density of air is about 1.23 kilograms per cubic meter, whereas the density of water is about a thousand. So it fits that rule of thumb. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was a definition. Uh, the term incompressible we'll use frequently in this course. So let me um, make a note of that right here. So incompressible, we'll use that term frequently. What that means is that the density remains constant. Sorry, it's all kind of crammed in here. So when we say that we have a flow uh, that has an incompressible fluid, what that means is that the density of that fluid remains constant. It's not going to vary. Now, liquids can typically be modeled as being incompressible. That's a pretty common assumption. It's, it's very good for engineering approximations. You have to get to huge pressures before you can compress a liquid enough so that it becomes, uh, so that its density changes. Gases, on the other hand, you know, are much more compressible. Under certain circumstances, however, when the pressure doesn't vary too much, you can model gases as being incompressible, but it's, it's only under special circumstances. Liquids, however, we typically assume to be incompressible. All right, so let's continue on. We'll talk about pressure. The symbol that we'll use for pressure is P, and it has dimensions of force per unit area, or force per length squared. Common units for pressure would be a pascal, which is a newton per square meter, or a pound force per square inch, which is also known as a PSI, pounds per square inch, or pounds force per square foot, which is PSF. Those are all common units. Some other ones that you'll typically see will be a bar, like one bar is 100 kilopascals. You might remember that from thermodynamics. We also have one atmosphere, which is 101.3 kilopascals which makes sense, that's the standard pressure. Um, and one atmosphere is also equal to 760 millimeters of mercury or 29.92 inches of mercury. That, those are other ways to measure pressure in terms of millimeters of mercury or inches of mercury. We'll say more about that when we talk about um, barometers, okay? so. That, those measurements, millimeters mercury, inches of mercury, come from barometers. So I just wanted to show it here as a little preview. But these are all different ways that you can measure or you can express pressures in all these different kinds of units. All right, let's move on to the next thing, pressure force. So we, we know that um, if you have pressure acting on a surface, it'll create some sort of pressure force normal to that surface. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about that. So first of all, the pressure is a scalar. It's just a number, it has no orientation to it. However, pressure force has a direction, it's a vector. So the, the orientation of the pressure, pressure force comes from the surface's orientation. So let me go ahead and draw a surface here. So let's say we have some surface there with some small area dA. The d just means differentially small, it means tiny, really tiny. And I'll explain why we want to do things in terms of differentially small quantities in just a moment. But we have this area, dA. Uh, right now it just has some size to it. It doesn't have an orientation. To give it an orientation, we'll put a, a unit normal vector on it. Call it n hat. So it's a unit normal, so the magnitude of n hat is just 1. And it's at right angles to the surface. Right, so it's kind of like my hand has this, it has a certain area to it, and then I put a unit normal vector on it. Now I have some orientation to that surface. If I rotate my hand, you can see the unit normal vector changes its orientation. So the area dA is really just some magnitude dA times the unit normal vector n hat, and that makes it a vector. Now the pressure force will act inward on that surface, also at right angles, and I'll write it as dFp. That's the pressure force. It's, again, the D just means a small amount of pressure force. And DFP will be the pressure times the area, or actually times the minus of the area. because The minus sign is because it acts inward. It's in the opposite direction of the, the unit normal for the area. You can see that in the picture here. The, 
the blue pressure force vector is in the opposite direction of n hat, so that's why we have a minus dA. You've already probably heard that pressure times an area gives you a force, and that's exactly what I've written here, but I've written it in vector form, taking into account that the pressure is acting inward. So why does the pressure, pressure act inward? It's because you have molecules bouncing against the surface. So for example, if I just sketched out a few of those molecules, you have a bunch of, uh, let's say, air molecules here. They're bouncing around, and they'll bounce off the surface. And every time they impact the surface, there's some momentum exchange going on. And they, they, if you change the momentum of an air molecule, some force must, must have acted on it. And that force is that the force the wall or the area exerts on the molecules, so the molecules exert an equal and opposite force on the wall. You're familiar with this. If you held a shield and someone threw tennis balls at you, you would feel like a force was acting on it. That's the same idea with pressure. It's just the molecules bouncing against the wall. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about why we're dealing with um, these small areas. And the reason for that is, let's, let's imagine the following. Let's say I had some surface. I'll draw it in 2D. Let's say we had a curved surface like that. So now the normal vector over here is in that direction. The normal vector here is in that direction. Here the normal vector is that direction. And then let me put some pressure that varies over the surface. So we have some sort of crazy pressure profile. Now, if you were to say the pressure is just the pressure force is just pressure times the area when i look at this picture what pressure should i use it varies all over the surface there's no single value for the pressure do i use the average pressure do i use the maximum do i use the minimum do i use uh, two-thirds of the pressure it's just not clear there's no well-defined pressure similarly if you look at the areas the normal vectors are changing direction everywhere so which direction does the pressure force act? It's not clear because the, the normal vectors change, so it's ill-defined. You can't simply say pressure times the area here because pressure and orientation are, are not well-defined over the whole surface. Instead, though, if we zoom in on a very small part of the surface, so if I zoom in just on a little bit of area, let's, let me go ahead and draw it right here, that little area, dA, that has this normal vector, n hat, over a very small area, the orientation is well-defined. I'm so close to that area that there's just one normal vector because I'm zoomed in so closely to it. And also on that little bit of surface, the pressure is also well-defined because as you zoom in really, really close, you'll see that the pressure really doesn't vary that much over that small area. And if I make the area smaller and smaller, the pressure essentially approaches just a single value. So now the pressure and the orientation are well defined. So I can do pressure times an area over a small area and get our little bit of pressure force. So that gives me the little bit of pressure force over that one small area. And again, it's just going to be written as dFp equals p times minus dA. So if I want the total pressure force over the whole area, over this, this whole curved surface, what I would do is just take the pressure force and add it all, all those little bits of pressure forces and add them all up. And so that's actually the integral over the whole area of P times minus dA. So that's how you'd find the net pressure force over the whole area. You add up all the little bits of pressure force and by adding up the little bits, you take into account the varying area and the varying orientation. You're just adding them together. The integral is just a summation. In fact, it looks like an S because it's a summation. That's, that's what an integral sign looks like. So that's a preview. We're going to talk in a different video about hydrostatic pressure forces where we make use of this integration approach. And we use this all the time for other kinds of forces like viscous forces and other things. So we'll be dealing with that um, later in the course. All right, so let's move on. We'll talk now about absolute and gauge pressures. You may have seen this from your thermal course previously. So let's start with absolute pressure. So an absolute pressure is a pressure referenced to a vacuum. What that means is that the pressure of a perfect vacuum is zero in terms of absolute pressure. And I'll indicate that with a little parentheses ABS for absolute. So the pressure of a vacuum, a perfect vacuum, is zero. Okay. 
Atmospheric pressure would be 101.3 kilopascals absolute, or in English units, 14.7 PSI A. The A here just indicates absolute pressure, so pounds per square inch absolute. So that's what an absolute pressure is. This is kind of the pressure that you, you normally are used to working with. Now there's another kind of pressure called a gauge pressure, and it's a pressure referenced to the atmosphere. So P atmosphere is zero gauge, because we're using that as our reference point. And again, I, I indicate that it's a gauge pressure by putting the word gauge in parentheses. So the pressure of a vacuum in terms of gauge pressure would be minus 101.3 kilopascals gauge or minus 14.7 PSI G. The G indicates it's a gauge pressure, pounds per square inch gauge. So it's, it's, we have two different ways to express the pressure. The reason we, we have a gauge pressure is because a lot of the instrumentation that we use to measure pressure actually measures the pressure relative to the atmosphere. So uh, it actually will measure a gauge pressure, like, your, like the tire pressure gauge that you use to measure the pressure in your car or bicycle wheel. That device actually measures a gauge pressure. It's the pressure relative to the surrounding atmosphere. Okay, So that's why we have a gauge pressure. To convert between the two is pretty straightforward. It's just P gauge is equal to the absolute pressure minus the atmospheric pressure in terms of absolute pressure. So that's how you would convert between them. So it's pretty straightforward. So we'll use gauge pressures often when we're measuring pressure, you know, using uh, devices known as manometers, tire pressure gauges, things like that. Um, also, when we calculate pressure forces, we'll use gauge pressures, and I'll explain that in a different video. It's just easier to do it that way. But when you use the ideal gas law or anything derived from the ideal gas law, then you need to use an absolute pressure. So let me make a note of that. So in the ideal gas law, P equals rho RT. R is the gas constant for whatever gas you're dealing with. The P here must be an absolute pressure. And the T, as a reminder, must be an absolute temperature, like Kelvin or degrees Rankine. So anything, anytime you use the ideal gas law or anything derived from it, you need to make sure you're using the absolute pressure. It won't work with a gauge pressure. All right, I think I've covered everything I wanted to in this lecture, so we'll go ahead and end it there.